us the first. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for coming tonight. Man, this is crazy. Uh, Monday night, you can be seated. Monday night and you're in church. Last days, Jesus is coming soon, isn't he? Hallelujah. So we've gotten into a lot of stuff about the coming of the Lord. Why would we do that? Because he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as some would do, especially as you see the day approaching. So the closer we get, we're going to gather all the more, and we're going to hear about his return, and we're going to do the will of God before Jesus comes. We have a lot to do in a short period of time. I think I said it yesterday, morning and night. It's not an escape theology. It's a see the finish line, and you run faster. So I've never seen a guy in a race see the finish line and go, so I think I'll chill now. No, no, you, you hustle. <laughs> and all the training goes in for that last little bit, and you have that kick to where you run and accelerate. And uh, we're so privileged that we can watch the setup for the coming of the Lord right now. How crazy is that? That you can see the technology of all the nations coming together and literally the players on the field for the king to come back. Amen. How wild is that? I want to say hi to a couple of people. I can't believe well, my best buddy Tom DeMont's here from Silo and Springs. Tom, thanks for coming, buddy. And you brought your mom, Taddy. Good to see you, Taddy. Bless you, bless you. This is the guy I was talking about when I said I had that vision over the Temple Mount. And, I, and Tom said, you need to come back to earth. So when I, when I saw the angels, so he, uh, it, we're dear friends. And this is something that just still shocks me. Uh, Pastor Tommy Brown from Spring Hill, Louisiana is here. And uh, God bless you, Tommy. Good to see you. What a treat to have you here. I'm telling you. He's going to get, you're going to see him in the future. You'll see him in heaven. There'll be these crowns, and they'll go, man, what is that holding up all those crowns? He'll go, I pastored in Spring Hill, Louisiana. Hallelujah. <laughs> so there's going to be some massive, I'm sure people have to help you walk because it'll be so cool, but uh, thank you for coming, and your friend, uh, sorry, I forgot your name. I'm so glad you came too. Bless you, bless you, and uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to come. I know you're very, very busy. But I believe you'll have uh, little ribbons on your robe. You'll have different stitching on your robe indicating you went to church on weeknights. <laughs> and, uh, man, I mean, your robe's going to preach for you. We didn't talk about the reward seat of Christ last night, but what you do for, for him will preach for you. Uh, I like it. It'd be just like the military. I've never seen a general in the military go, hey, I was faithful, I was faithful, I was faithful. No, his uniform preaches for him. And uh, what you're doing on the earth uh, suits you up for the millennial reign of Christ. You're writing your resume for what you'll be doing during that thousand years. So you want some robes. You want some stitching. You want some uh, things that show what you did while you're on the earth. You want something that's eternal. You don't want to be walking around the millennium in a Speedo bathing suit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> my, dad, my dad got saved on his deathbed. I'm going to be throwing robes at him. Dad, put something on. <laughs> it's not going to be good, but you, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be dressed indicative of your faithfulness. So you're going to have little things that show you were here on Monday night, you're here on Wednesday night, Tuesday night, or whenever you took extra time to come hear the word. Why is that? You're communicating you love him. You're communicating you love him. Amen. That went over real good. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Come on. <laughs> Grab your Bibles, and let's go back to Luke, and let's do a couple minutes of review. We're going to get into a little bit more tonight. Last night was rapture of the church, how we'll be caught up. We're going to evacuate the earth just like Enoch did, just like Elijah did, uh, just like Jesus did. Soon we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, taking off. And uh, the church has so much authority. Paul talked about it. He said, don't worry, you, 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 the Antichrist can't be revealed until, until you leave, you depart. Everybody thought that was a departure from the faith. If that was true, he would have come during the dark ages. So uh, it's amazing how much authority the church has. So let's get into all of it tonight. Uh, we're supposed to go four hours tonight. Pizza will come in at 10, and then we'll break. And then we'll, <laughs> no. have, do I, I don't preach long, do I? I try to make sure we get out so you can come back. Remember John Osteen said, he who preaches short shall be hurt again. Praise the Lord. So we, we try to keep it short. So here we go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We're amazed, amazed uh, about what you're doing in these last days. We're so blown away by your mercy, your kindness. We magnify uh, your goodness tonight, Lord, that death could not hold you down, that you overcame death, hell, and the grave, Lord. We thank you that we get to display and see the resurrection shown forth through every believer in this room. And Father, what you've given beyond church, we thank you for this uh, renewal of assignments, uh, a refreshing of assignments, Lord, for this church, what you've called them to do in the last days. 
I ask you to amplify their voice in this whole region. May this church be a pool of Bethesda for people to come from all around and see the ministry of Jesus. That Jesus, Jesus, you would be magnified. Jesus, you would be lifted up. So we exalt you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We're amazed that we're about to see you so soon, Lord. So, Father, help us. Help us. Help us walk in the full measure of everything Jesus left us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' wonderful name, everybody said amen. So last night was rapture. The, the service before that was the signs of the coming of the Lord. There's about 50. I think we went through about 10 or 15. I think there's signs on the back of the shirts. If you don't buy a shirt, at least take a picture of the signs. My favorite sign, which I didn't even get into, was Aerosmith Stephen Tyler got saved. So uh, when Aerosmith's getting born again, you need to lift up your heads. The Lord's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, when you got Lenny Kravitz getting him born again, uh, I don't really remember calling Lenny Kravitz the guitar prayer, player, Lenny Kravitz the evangelist. But anyway, he led Stephen Tyler to the Lord. So we got all these things happening. So let's go back to Luke for about five minutes, then we'll kick into what we're going to get into tonight. And we'll be strengthened, we'll be encouraged, we'll be blessed. So look at Luke 21. Grab your Bibles there. It's page, I believe it's page 108 if you've got a Bible like mine. And Jesus says some things super, super clear here for a minute to show us how close we are. So look at Luke 21, verse 24. They'll fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down or overthrown of the Gentiles or nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Jesus said you could tie some timing to Jerusalem being won back. We've got into that every service. Uh, the Six-Day War happened and Israel got Jerusalem back. What a miracle that was. Uh, pretty uh, bizarre how precise it all is. You have one jubilee from 1917. 50 years from 1917. We talked about what happened in 17. Kenneth Hagin being born. The Lord appearing to his mother, telling him to name him John. She didn't name him John, named him Kenneth. And uh, the Hagen in the Hebrew means one to go before to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Literally, John the Baptist's definition. So 50 years from that time, one jubilee, Jerusalem's won back. The timing of God is absolutely flawless. So watch the Lord make it even clearer. He's going to go into verse 29 and make it even more ar inarguable or exact or precise. He says in verse 29, uh, look at the fig tree, that's the nation of Israel. And the other trees, that's the trees around Israel prophetic nations. He said, when they now shoot forth their bud, you see and know of your own selves that summer our harvest is nigh at hand. Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know. So he, he's telling us these things so we can know something. He said, when you see these things come to pass, know. What things? Israel made a nation of Jerusalem one back. When you see these things, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The next verse, we've got into it both services. What's the next verse say? This is bold. Watch what he says in verse 32. Verily I say unto you, this generations shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. Wow. So the group of people that sees those two events won't pass away till all is fulfilled. I hear people all the time going, well, if you talk about the coming of... A famous evangelist told me, if you talk about the coming of the Lord, Joe, you just get everybody's hopes up. Duh, that's exactly right. It's called the hope that purifies you even as you're pure. So Paul wrote about the rapture of the church so we'd be happy and hopeful. The whole purpose of hearing about the coming of the Lord is so that we have a radical expectation. I said it the other day, just like when Colleen and I got married. Colleen came walking down the aisle. Colleen, didn't, she didn't walk down the aisle like this. Oh, my God, there he is. I'm going to marry that guy. Another one bites the dust. She wasn't even bowed over like that at all. She, actually, she seemed pretty excited, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> if you were bummed out at your wedding, something's wrong, okay? So the Lord wants us right before the biggest gathering ever to be excited, can you imagine the, the night before you're going to get married? You call your, your girl you're engaged to. How's it going? I'm depressed. Really? What are you depressed about? What's going to happen tomorrow? Wow. Well, I, I would start rethinking some things, recalibrating some things. Like there should be radical expectation and joy. If you weren't excited the night before you got married, you made a mistake. Well, that went over real good. <laughs> No, he wants you excited. So here he's writing these things to us so that we can tell we're that generation. I hear people all the time, well, you can't tell when the Lord's coming back. Actually, you can if you can read. Okay? If you were driving from, from uh, Little Rock to Dallas and it said 310 miles, you got halfway there, you had 150 miles. The next sign says 130. Next sign says uh, 90. Next sign says 70. You don't go, oh, my God, I'm never going to make it to Dallas. No, the signs tell you you're headed that way. So we got into signs yesterday and got into signals. Now, let's go through the signs. You got Israel made a nation. You got Jerusalem won back. You got the Hebrew language restored. 
You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. You got the fertility of the land of Israel. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. They even have their capital building where they rebuilt it identical to the Tower of Babel. So you have all these things. You have the Temple Mount Institute. You have 172 different species of predatory birds start showing up in the land. So you have the cleanup crew there. So you've got nature in position. You, <laughs> you had fish show up in the Dead Sea last year. Ezekiel prophesied it 2,700 years ago. Four weeks ago, you had foxes show up on the Temple Mount. That's Lamentations 518. Pretty radical. Uh, this last week, you had water show up at the Temple Mount in the baths. First time in 2,000 years. You had the Bethlehem Star show up last year. First time in 2,000 years. You had blood red moons on Passover and Tabernacles. Four in a row. When's the last time you had four in a row? 1967 when Jerusalem was won back. 1948 when Israel's made a nation. So you have all this stuff. Uh, 1492 with the Edict of Expulsion. So you got, you got tangible, physical things screaming the king's coming back. So the church, as we do, you're, I'm preaching to the choir because you're here on Monday night. But in other words, the church is so preoccupied and so busy, doesn't even comprehend the Lord's coming back. Now, why, why do I say that? Because if you comprehend he's coming back, you'll change your life. Well, that went over real good. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Come on. No, if you thought the Lord was coming tomorrow, you'd be a whole lot sweeter tonight. You wouldn't be, hey, what's going on? No, you'd be like, uh, I'm about to see Jesus face to face. I would assume it would curb some, of the, some of, of the anger, some of the frustration. You'd be like, hey, how's it going? There'd be a sweetness because you're about to see Jesus. <laughs> I would think, now listen, I might say that because my mom, growing up, she'd go, hey, the, the rapture's going to happen tonight. And I'd go, Lord, I love you. It scared me so bad. I, I went to bed every night telling the Lord how much I loved him. So my response in hearing the coming of the Lord, you can either be haughty or humble. And that, that haughtiness is being reserved for that seven-year period called the tribulation. That man's so haughty, well, I'll do it my way. Well, we'll see how that works during that seven-year period. It's not going to be good. So thank you, Jesus, we get to see the setup for that seven-year period where Jesus will reveal himself to his brethren at the very end. Just like Joseph. Wow, absolutely amazing. So let's go over a little further. And let's look and see what the church should look like. So this stuff that we all know, but grab your Bibles there and go over to James. You just pick out the chapter. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. Go to James chapter 5, and we'll start here. And let's look at what the church is supposed to look like. And uh, it's really cool here. It's real clear. James 5 is an end times chapter. He talks about the early and the latter rain, tells you to be patient and stable. Then he tells you what the payoff will be for patience and stability. He said, you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord's very pitiful and of tender mercy. Talking about Job. And, uh, you know, I thought, why would he put Job in an end time chapter? Well, Job got uh, restoration. Uh, he got double of what he had lost. What he greatly feared came upon him. But at the end of his life, he got back double. How cool is that? Wouldn't it be cool if someone steals your car? You go, uh, no problem. You're going to get two cars. You talk about being in good hands, that's pretty cool. Uh, your house burns down, no problem, we're going to build you two houses. So that would be cool to have double. So he's trying to get you ready for what last day church should be like. It should be double of what the early church was. So with that, we're going to skip down to verse 16, I believe it is, of James 5. He says, confess your faults one to another. I've never been to a fault confessing service of you. Man, that'd be a long service, wouldn't it? <laughs> I know just with Tom DeMott, we'd be here for days. <laughs> I told Kyle, I said, pure evil is here tonight. Well, let's get our phones out. I'm going to cast the devil out of him. It's going to be on video. It's going to be awesome. No, it's not, it's not going to be like that. But could you imagine? Confess your faults one to another. He's trying to show you in spite of your faults, in spite of your frailties, you can still walk in the supernatural. He says, pray for one another that you may be healed. The affectionate fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he switches over in the next verse there. Look at verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And yet he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So he finishes an end time chapter here with the ministry of Elijah. I thought, why in the world would you do that? Well, he's trying to show you uh, this is what the church will function like. Where uh, I did, not one time did you hear Elijah go, they would go, well, he's a great orator. He's a great preacher. No, they knew God was with him. Indicating the church, people should see that God is with us. Just like Elijah dictated the natural atmosphere, the church will dictate spiritual atmosphere. That's pretty radical to have so much authority that you can go, by the way, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. So we don't have to get weird. We don't have to have uh, leather girdles or locust burgers or weird stuff. Or Because we think of the ministry of Elijah, you automatically think of weird. It's just people could see that God was with him. 
Everywhere he went, they didn't go, hmm, is, that, is God with that guy? They could tell God was with that guy. Even in the ministry of Jesus, not one time did they say, man, he's a preaching machine. Like we think of Brother Shambach. I love Brother Shambach. And, and we were talking about him a while ago. He's a preaching machine. But one, not one time about Jesus did they say, man, he's a preaching machine. They said, listen to the authority at which he speaks. So he's talking about the end time church will look like that, having so much authority and so much power. So with that, grab your Bibles and go over to um, Thessalonians. Before we go there, I was preaching, as you're turning to Thessalonians, as you're making your way there to 1 Thessalonians, I was preaching in um, Tucson, Arizona years ago. Gosh, like 1989, 1990. It's Bruce Brock's church. His mother actually played the organ for William Branham. So while I was there, I began to talk about Brother Shambach, and I began to, because you just feel that, that it's a tangibility to that. So I talked about Brother Shambach, talked about that miracle that they had when he was working for A.A. A. Allen. Now, this is really cool. He's working for A.A. A. Allen in 1950. There was that baby that had no arms, no legs, no eyes, and uh, this mother had brought the baby to the tent meeting, about 10,000 people in the tent meeting, and she'd been telling Shambach, when's Shambach going to pray for my baby? And she, I mean, when's A.A. A. Allen going to pray for my baby? And Brother Shambach said, well, when your card is called, we'll make sure your baby's prayed for. And the, went the whole week without the baby being prayed for. So Brother Allen got up the last night. He said, well, we're going to take up a faith offering. And uh, he just said, it's an offering you can't afford. This lady came down and put like $15 in the bucket. Brother, how do I know? Brother Shambach uh, told me the whole story. He said, I got off the organ, walked over there, and saw how much money she put in. He was actually concerned for her. And then Brother Allen began to preach. You know, you know Brother, <laughs> Brother A. Allen, his messages were so interesting. But look at this man. The devil's all over him. So he's getting miracles and cool stuff. Midway through his service, though, he said, wait a minute. I'm not here. He had a word of knowledge. He said, I'm at an OB ward up in Tennessee. He said, I see you coming over the Alabama-Tennessee border. Your baby's deformed, but it's alive. The doctor said it couldn't live. And man, Brother Shambach, his ears perked up. and go, that's the lady. He's been bugging me all week about her baby. Right about then, he said, bring the woman down. They brought the woman down with the baby. The baby had no arms, no legs, no eyes. Had a little hole for her nose, a little hole for her mouth. Brother Shambach said, I normally close my eyes when I pray, but I wasn't going to miss this miracle. He said, right then, it said it sounded like cordwood. Snap, snap, snap. Right then, the baby got brand new legs, brand new arms. Of swirls came on that baby's eyes. The baby got brand new eyes in front of everybody. As crazy as that is and as rejoicing as that is, everybody quit looking at the baby and looked over at the stretcher section. 300 people on stretchers. When they looked at the stretcher section, every single one of them were instantly healed. Now, that's pretty radical. Baby gets created. Every person in the stretcher section gets healed. And he said, somehow, we just need to turn around. They turned around, and there was a busload of blind people that were lost, couldn't, get, couldn't find the tent. And then they came walking in the back door midway through the service. Every single one of them got their sight. So I'm, I'm preaching this in Tucson, and I'm telling the story about, listen to this, this is 89 or 90. I said, God's setting the world up for reality. You're going to see reality TV. I said, what's the most popular reality TV show on? And this man yelled out, Baywatch. I said, that's not reality TV. I mean, 2,000 people out, he goes, Baywatch. I'm like, wow, okay, here we go. So the Lord was trying to show them that he's going to display miracles. And uh, so I, at the end of the service, you know, I finished and preached a little bit. And uh, this man walks up to me and he goes, he goes hey, I'm A.A. A. Allen's son. I said, well, nice to meet you. I'm Billy Graham, because I'm so used to people playing jokes on me that I thought he was just messing with me. He goes, no, 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 I, I, I'm A. Allen's son. I forgot A. Allen had moved to Miracle Valley and brought his ministry out there to Tucson. This is what his son said to me. He said, those were miracles were great for my dad's day. He said, but I see a day where believers are functioning just like a few did in the 50s. And that's why God raised you up is to display the resurrection. So just as we get into the signs of the coming of the Lord, just as we get into the rapture, we have something, a function we've got to do before we leave. So watch the Lord here in Thessalonians. Did you find Thessalonians? Go over there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Watch what he says there in verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And you became followers, this word followers is the word mimickers or imitators. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So they heard one message and they said, I can look like Paul and I can look like Christ. That's radical. I've heard message after message after message. Well, if you travel with Brother Shambach, if you travel with Brother Hagen, you'll get that anointing on you. You don't have to travel with somebody. You've got somebody traveling with you. 
Here, they, they heard a message that made them and liberated them to go, I can be just like Paul. And just like Jesus. What was that message? Basic authorization. You can't hardly even get into that because people think it's boring. But there's something about simplistic authorization that provided them an avenue to be just like the Lord. That's radical. Now, you know, we don't have a, a lot of the feeling here in our country, but I remember when I drove, I, I grew up in Spring Hill. I was driving a truck. We were hauling hay when I was 10 years old. I thought, when I turn 13, I'll get that car, that truck. I turn 14, you get your permit, you got your license when you're 15. I couldn't wait to get my license to be legal. Because <laughs> you see a police officer when you're buzzing around when you're 10, it's not a cool thing. Amen. <laughs> the wheels are running right there. I didn't do it when I was 10. Come on, I, I did it when I was 11. Come on. <laughs> Don't. But, you know, what I like about that is uh, I love uh, Tom pastored in Heidelberg, Germany. And the, thing, the cool thing about Germany is, is there's no speed limit. You can't get any cooler than that. <laughs> that you get accustomed to maxing it out. That's just righteous that you can go as fast as you want to go. I remember John and Michelle, my sister and brother-in-law, drove me from Bonn to Brussels. And they went 160 miles an hour the whole way. Now, the only reason they didn't go any faster was there was a sticker on the thing that the tires were not rated for any faster. <laughs> or we'd be going faster. <laughs> How cool is that? And there's people passing us. I thought, man, that, they're passing us and we're, we're going so fast all you can hear is wind noise. I mean, this is righteous. This is godly. This, this is proper. <laughs> I remember another pastor, Tom knows him, Arthur Reimer. He drove me from Frankfurt down to Zurich. He kept it pegged at red line for three hours. I said, Arthur, don't you want to let the motor rest for just a second? You know, I think that if you let it rest a little bit, it might last a little longer. He goes, well, why would I do that? Like I was an idiot for thinking, take it off of red line. Well, it, they're, they're just accustomed to maxing it out. You can tell an American when you see an American on the Autobahn, they're buzzing along, white knuckling. <laughs> but, but this is like the church. Could you imagine you got a, maybe you got a Porsche 911, you got 500 horsepower, and you're buzzing along on the Autobahn going 70 miles an hour in first gear and think you're cool, like, hey, good to see everybody, I'm in a 911. Hello, you got six more gears, you got seven gears, you can be going 185. But see, that's a picture of the church. We've been authorized to be just like him, and we've settled for first gear. Come on, this, they heard this message, and they began to act like Paul. Wow. He called it light affliction, which is but for a moment. Getting stoned, left for dead, light affliction. Man, I would have got the violin out and I'd started going, this is not light affliction, this is serious affliction. But there's something in you, a conquering mentality, a, a daringness. If you want to hear the message that you're just like him, it makes you different. All right, let's go back. Grab your Bibles. You got your Bibles there? Go back to Luke. Go to Luke. You pick out the chapter. See if you're flowing. Come on. Go back to Luke and let's go to Luke 9. Luke chapter 9. Let's run through a couple things here because we're, we're, we're headed somewhere. We're not quite there, but we'll get there. So if you don't like my first message, just hang out. We'll get to something you like here in a minute, okay? <laughs> Look at Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 1. This is so amazing. Luke 9 verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over devils and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So guess how long it took them to duplicate Jesus' ministry? Instantaneous. Not five years, not seven years. Didn't step into this anointing. He authorized them and they believed him. And they duplicated his ministry. Well, then you go, well, that's the 12. You know, that's the special 12. Surely they can do it and we can't do it. Well, go to Luke 10. Go over one more chapter. Grab your Bibles there and go to Luke 10. Look at this. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 also, sent them two by two before his face into every city and place wherever he would go. So here, here's another 70. And guess how long it took them to duplicate the Lord's ministry? Instantaneous. They believed Jesus. They're, it so freaked them out. They said, look, Lord, the devils are even subject to us in your name. And he said, man, that's not a big deal. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Wow. Hallelujah. He said, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So notice, even when Jesus came walking into a city, there was instant submission. Devils start going, are you, are you come to torment us before the time? Instant submission. And when they went out with his authority, instant submission. 
That's the reality of it. You remember John Osteen? How many of you like Brother Osteen? I love Brother John Osteen. I love him. He's in heaven having a blast right now. I remember that one story he talks about where that one preacher was afraid of the devil. Do you remember that story? He had a buddy, a friend, that was afraid of the devil. And here, that friend had this vision. All of a sudden, the devil's walking down this cavern. He's in this dark cave. And the devil's walking toward him. The very thing he's afraid of and nervous about, Satan appears to him, walking right toward him. And just as the devil's walking right toward that friend of John Osteen, he's a preacher. He's going like, man, this is not cool. The very thing I'm afraid of is happening happening right here all of a sudden Jesus appeared right in front of that preacher and just as Lucifer comes walking up Jesus tells the devil you've got to get on your knees and bow because I live in this man right then Jesus backed into that preacher Woo, come on so here's 12 here's 70 and what they do they duplicated Jesus's ministry go back to verse 49 of Luke 9 go back one chapter everybody still with me look at verse 49 John answered, said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbid him because he didn't follow us. And the Lord said, Forbid him not. He that's not against us is for us. This guy hadn't even been authorized, but he had enough brains to see what worked. Okay, so they duplicated his ministry. Easy. Not six years later, not five years later. Instantaneous. With one key, basic authorization. Jesus goes, I'm not here. You're here for me. Okay, let's talk about this for a second because I'm getting close to my message. It just takes me a minute. You know, I'm almost, we're almost in, in the downhill slide of it. Here we go. I'm, I like to quote Brother Hagin. You know, uh, he finished his course. Brother Hagin tells a story. What a cool story this is. Let this bless you. He had a preacher friend of his, a pastor, that had full-blown sugar diabetes. So his pancreas is not producing the proper amount of insulin, so he's manually having to adjust his sugar level with, with manually uh, adjusting his insulin. Brother, he's going to travel with Brother Hagin for two weeks, so Brother Hagin told him, while you're near me, while you're within my realm of authority, you won't register any sugar. And that pastor goes, really? He goes, that's right. He said, while you're near me or around my authority, you won't register any sugar. And the first night, he ate cakes and pies. Checked his insulin level the next morning. Sugar level was normal. He said, man, that beats anything I've ever seen. He goes, here, I'm not even supposed to eat cakes and pies, and my sugar level is normal. He goes, I wish I could do that. Brother Hagin said, it doesn't come by wishing. It comes by believing. There was a residue of two weeks after Brother Hagen was away from that man. That man was home that his, his pancreas came alive and produced the proper amount of insulin just because Kenneth Hagen said, while you're near me, your pancreas will come alive. Now, Brother Hagen called that the edge of authority. He didn't even call that authority. He called it the edge. Who would it be like to operate in real authority? Giddy up. Come on. <laughs> Am I in the right room? Come on. So, so here Brother Hagen talks like that. And, and, and what's Brother Hagen's basic message? Basic faith. Let me give you another one. How many of you like Brother Wigglesworth? Don't you like Smith Wigglesworth? Well, I love his stories. I was preaching in Newcastle, England years ago on the God Channel. There, this guy was interviewing me on gifts of the Spirit. And pretty much, come to find out, he's not even born again. <laughs> so they're going interview, to interview me in Newcastle, England. So I get on the TV show there, and this guy asks me a question. He goes, holy cow. I'm like, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. I had a lady in, in uh, 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 Topeka, Kansas, in the Church of Nazarene, had no fingers, got new fingers. Her fingers were severed off. I had a word of knowledge. Someone had damage in their knuckles. The youth group was talking while I was preaching. I couldn't get them to stop talking. So I walked out there to the youth group, and I preached while I was right there by them, and they still talked. So then I said, okay, everybody under 21, stand up. And I, they stood up, and I began to preach to them that they got to pay more attention than we do, and they still talked. So I had a word of knowledge. Someone had damage in their knuckles. I thought arthritis. I thought, no big deal. This lady comes walking down. She's got one finger like this. These fingers are severed. I go, Lord, that's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking arthritis, not no fingers, okay? So I said, Lord, thank you for new fingers. For her, boom, her fingers grew out. The, the youth group got supernaturally quiet. Yeah, when they saw that lady get her fingers, man, that freaked them out. So that man's asking me about this on this TV program, and he's like, holy cow. And he, so we take a break, and, uh, <laughs> and, and this elderly lady could tell that it was a little bit difficult because the guy was not even saved interviewing me. <laughs> so this elderly woman comes up to me and goes, hey, you know, New, uh, Newcastle's where Wigglesworth got uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. I go, yeah, I know that. I'm so glad to be in, in the same town where that happened. She goes, let me tell you a story about Wigglesworth. R Brother Wigglesworth went to this funeral one time. There was a lady that had died, gone home to be with the Lord. And the Holy Ghost comes on Wigglesworth and tells him to go raise the woman up. So Wigglesworth goes over to this funeral, and uh, the Lord tells him to pick the woman up. Now think how weird this would be. 
goes over to the funeral, picks the woman up, takes her against the wall, and throws her against the wall and like this. And he goes, walk in Jesus' name. Boom. She hits the floor. That's, that's where I would have told, told the family, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just picked mom up and threw her against the wall and nothing happened. I just would have started apologizing before I even got close to him. Sorry, 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 sorry. You know what? He's not moved. He picks her up the second time, throws her against the wall. I said walk in Jesus' name. Boom, she hits the floor. That's where I would have made a door. I would have, le- I would have left. I would have never come back. I'd, have just took- I'd take it off running. I'd still be running. Not moved, not moved. Third time, picks her up, throws her against the wall. I said, walk in Jesus' name. Boom, she comes alive. She's in heaven talking to Jesus. Did I hear you screaming at me? Walk in Jesus' name. (laughs) The cool thing about that, what's Wigglesworth's message? Faith, righteousness, the name of Jesus. The things that our group thinks are boring right now built this platform for him to have special faith, working of miracles, and gifts of healings. The things I'm talking about tonight are the platform for the power of God to flow through you. Jesus was anointed two different ways. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Holy Ghost side was the gift sides. The power side is what we're talking about tonight, the authorization. Jesus told him we'd do the same works he did in John 14. He said, I'm giving you two keys, authority and presence. Authorization and presence, John 14. Authorization and presence. So we're, we're privileged that we have these tools, <laughs> and that's been invested in you, Hagen and Wigglesworth. All those messages are in you tonight. hundred years ago, you couldn't say that. 50 years ago, I got this 50 years ago, start hearing Kenneth Hagin. In 50 years, God's raised up independent churches that have this crazy mentality that God honors His Word. So we're so blessed, aren't we? It's in you tonight. Remember Daniel prophesied about you. He said he saw you. He said you'd know your God. You'd be strong and you'd do exploits. Isn't that cool? Heaven's already told you what you look like. You're strong. You know God. And you do exploits. Grab your Bibles. Let's go a little bit more. We're getting close. Almost there. Almost there. Hang with me. Almost there. Coming into the downhill slide. Here we go. Look at Matthew 28 or 27. You pick out the chapter. We'll see if you uh, got the right one. Look at Matthew 28. Look at this. This is so cool. Now, I know you know this, but, but the Lord kind of dealt me about finishing up these last two nights with uh, what the church is supposed to look like, not just signs and not just rapture. I mean, I know we got into the millennium last time a little bit because there's just a wonderful future. The rapture is not an ending. It's a beginning. You're going to be, you're tasting of the powers of the world to come. You're going to be operating in the gifts of the Spirit that whole thousand years. You'll be raising people up. It's in you to raise people up. It's going to be so cool. So let's go here to Matthew 28. That was a little diversion. So go back to Matthew 28 for just a moment. Matthew 28, look at verse 17. And this is the Great Commission we've heard a thousand times. It almost is like this, blah, 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 blah. But it's not blah, blah. It's supernaturally powerful. He says in verse 17, uh, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and teach all nations. So we, we've heard that over and over and over and over again. In the Greek, this is what they heard I'm giving you freedom of action, I'm giving you a right to act. We just hear authority, and it's kind of like boring. Oh, he, he gave us authority. No, I'm giving you a right to act. I'm giving you freedom of action. So that just gives you boldness to act in his behalf. Now, how many, how many of you like uh, uh, Brother Eastwood? How many like Clint Eastwood? Don't, don't you love Brother Eastwood? He's pretty cool. As a kid, my dad would take me to Clint Eastwood movies that I should not go see as a kid or should not, should not go see ever. He took me to Dirty Harry, took me to Magnum Force. I mean, I saw these movies. My mom would take me to meetings. My dad would take me to bars and take me to Clint Eastwood movies. So I love the Clint Eastwood movies. I mean, don't you love Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry? Remember the scene? It's iconic where he goes, a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world. Uh, I can't remember if I've shot five times or six times. You feel lucky, punk? Go ahead and make my day. That guy on the ground's freaking out because it's so iconic. It's powerful. I mean, he's got that 44 Magnum. It's, it's, that, the gun's huge. But you know what? It's not real. It, it's, it's a movie. It's fake. And, you know, and, and Clint Eastwood probably doesn't even like guns. He's from California. Come on. <laughs> so, 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 but you know what? He, he's a professional. 
So what the director said, okay, Clint, we got this one scene. You're going to have to pull this off. We're going to give you a, 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 a fake gun. And when I say action, I want you walking over there. And I want you to make that guy think on the ground you're going to blow his head off. So, you know, you know the whole story. They get all the lighting ready. Clint learns his line so he can do it right, you know, and he gets ready. And, man, the director goes, action. Oh, the confusion. You feel lucky, punk. I mean, it's amazing. It's so cool. But look at this. How, how dare Clint Eastwood... Be so bold about a script that's not real when you have a holy script that is real. How dare somebody be bolder about something that's fake than what you have is reality. Jesus said, I give you a right to act and freedom of action. Now, what's amazing is in the movie, (laughs) this this is our group. In the movie, we've been taught, well, you're the guy on the ground. You're a victim. You're going to have to go through tests and trials. No! You find you get some word in you, and you find out you're not the guy on the ground. Get a little more word in you, you almost start thinking you're Clint Eastwood. But you know what? You're not the guy on the ground. You're not Clint Eastwood. Guess who you are in the movie? You're Jesus. You're his stand-in. The reason why people don't know what's going on is they don't know their lines. Could you imagine Clint Eastwood? Action! In all the confusion, do you feel lucky? Well, that just doesn't carry any weight. God's invested the word in you so you'd know your lines. He's put the word in you so you'd be saying, it is written, and that's it, period. You know, hang with me. I'm, 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 I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Hang with me. Almost done. Almost done. Um, years ago, I was preaching in Pittsburgh. And thank you, Jesus, we're not in Pittsburgh tonight. God bless Pittsburgh. The only place I've cast out devils and people in America is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I could tell you some devil stories that are just the weirdest thing on the planet. But anyway, I was preaching there one year, and I prayed for this baby. A baby got healed of Down syndrome. It's about two years old. It's mongoloid. Got healed, and the parents were so happy. They supported me for almost 25 years. And I said, you don't, you, need, you don't need to support me. But they were just so happy their baby got healed. They had Down syndrome. So one of the years I was there, they said, will you pray for our 13-year-old? I said, sure, he didn't have Down syndrome, but it's good to pray for every 13-year-old, period, amen. <laughs> so so uh, that night, uh, I preached about heaven, and I never preached about heaven, never, pre- never ever preached about heaven, and never have p- before that and since then, but, but the kids weren't in the meeting that night, so I'm preaching about heaven. I'm like, why in the world am I preaching about heaven? I don't even know what's going on. So I finished the message, and then the youth came in, because I told them I'm going to pray for the 13-year-old. So they, they come in, the 13-year-old's there. And I went to praying over him. What am I praying over him? The word. He's a disciple to all the Lord. Grace his peace and his composure. He trusts in the Lord with all his heart. Lean not to his own understanding. Father, in all his ways, he acknowledges you. And, and, and you direct his path. In his pathway, there is light. And there is no darkness at all. So I'm speaking the word over him. And he, he falls out under the power and just lays there. And then, you know, I start talking to the family a little bit. Look back over at the 13-year-old. He's out cold, man. A couple more minutes, looked at the 13-year-old. And he started acting like my golden retriever. He's like, like dreaming. You know, when you see dogs dream, you know, they start moving around. That kid was on the ground doing all this stuff like he's dreaming. You know, they said, what do we do? I said, leave him alone. Let him enjoy it. So by the time you, know, you've, you finish going to the book table, talking at the book table a little bit, and it's time to leave, they said, what do we do? I said, well, I guess pick him up and haul him home. They picked him up, carried him home. In the middle of the night, that little kid come, uh, woke up and goes, hey, I went to heaven. And they said, man, shut up. Go back to sleep. It's the middle of the night. You know? <laughs> he goes, no, I saw Grandpa. And then he said, Grandpa took his biscuits and gravy just like this. And that's exactly what he did. They said, man, that's, a, that's what Grandpa did. He scraped his biscuits like that. Isn't it cool to know there's biscuits and gravy in heaven? Come on. <laughs> that's pretty cool. But that's not why I'm telling you a story. The cool thing is he's sitting there talking to his, his Grandpa, and Jesus walks in with this golden stick. Scepter of righteousness is the scepter of my kingdom. Jesus told that 13-year-old, he said, I don't have any authority in the earth. I gave it all to my church. Wow. See, we keep waiting for God to do something. He's waiting for us to do something. That's why you have to be raptured. He couldn't even do what he wanted to do during that seven-year period called the tribulation because you have so much authority. Jesus told that 13-year-old, I don't have any authority in the earth. I gave it all to my church. You should have heard him get up. He, he didn't do Elvis when he got up on stage. He didn't go like this. He go, I tell you, we got all the authority. No. He got up and said, he didn't do it real slick and cool. He goes, the Lord told us he gave us all of his authority. So I'm not laboring to get it. I've got it. I'm, I'm not laboring to get this. I, I have this. Now, this is what happens because I'm closing with this. Hang with me. I'll, I'll give you a couple more stories. Hang with me. With your authority, you set the tone. You set the th- with your authorization, you set the tone. That's what you do in your life. Whether you're realizing it or understanding it or not, that's what you're doing. 
And I remember this meeting, a buddy of mine, Ross Roberts, a crazy preacher friend of mine, made me go preach in this camp meeting years ago. We got off the plane. They interviewed us with, with TV cameras. They said, we want to interview us. I said, man, don't interview us. Don't interview me. Uh, interview Ross. In fact, there were posters all over town, Jesus is your healer. Okay? I'm not full-time in the ministry. I'm ushering in a church in Tulsa, and my buddy Ross is making me go preach. So <laughs> Ross does this with the TV program. I swear it's exactly what he did. We're standing right as you get off the plane. Ross goes to Elvis. He goes just like this. He goes... He goes, I dare you to bring the sick, bring the lame. I dare you bring the lame, the halt, the blind. I went, oh, my God. Just tell them to come to the meetings. Don't, just, just invite them. Don't. He goes, he goes, he, he got that crazy preacher looking. He goes, I dare you to come. God will heal. I was like, oh, my God. I just kind of walked away like, Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. You know, because I, I, I would just, if it was me, I'd have gone, hey, man, thanks for coming. Appreciate you coming to hear the word, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So we get there. And I preached that Sunday morning, it was hideous. I preached that Sunday morning, it was so bad. I had a lady walk up to me, she said, now don't try to do this for a living. <laughs> I said, I get it. You're, that wasn't the first lady to tell me that. She's like number four or five. I said, I got it. I got to understand. Not, don't try to do this for a living. It was so bad. So then we, <laughs> you know, hideous. Uh, it was so dry. We used to roll out bottles of water to people while they were preaching. It was so dry. <laughs> it was just dry as corn shake. So we come back Sunday night, and Ross is going to preach, but he wouldn't come out there because the, the music was so bad. The music was all, you know, he, he, I'm like, dude, come on. He goes, I ain't going out there. He said, I got to wait till the music's over because it was all, you know, ching a ling a ding ding. It, was, it didn't have, it wasn't, it wasn't any worship to it at all. Jesus was not even mentioned. But anyway, it just wasn't very good. <laughs> So I'm standing there waiting for Ross to come out. I'm just minding my own business going, Ross, come on, because he was kind of over in this room over here, and I'm waiting for him to come in. I look up and, and have discerning of spirits happen while I'm waiting for Ross. I look up, two huge angels are standing right there. Look like linebackers, like nine, ten feet tall, just stared at me just like this. I looked up at them, and I ducked my head. <laughs> I looked up at them again, because, I mean, I grew up in a word home. You know my mom. My, you know my mom. Uh, uh, I, I didn't ever ask for an angel to appear to me because I got a more sure word of prophecy. And at Raymond, they didn't teach you, this is what you do, and two angels come stand right there. I didn't have a clue what to do. So these, these guys just stood there glowing in the glory of God, looking so purposeful, staring right at me. I looked over at where all the kids were. There were a bunch of kids over here on the side, and there were angels all around the kids, too. But then I looked back up, and those angels were still staring at me. I'm like, man, what in the world is going on? Ross comes walking in. He goes, you got anything? No, 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 don't have anything, don't have anything. It's all over you. You got it, you got it. Woo, preach, buddy. <laughs> so he begins to preach. And uh, <laughs> the Holy Spirit said those angels had come to deliver a woman a new heart. I thought, well, that's, that's okay. I kind of got an idea of what's going on. I'm thinking Ross will call that out and some lady's going to get a new heart. Came to the end of the service. Ross didn't call it out. I said, Joe, you got something? I said, well, I guess I do. I said, there's a, 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 someone here. You got heart trouble. This lady got up, came walking down. And man, then I said, that's right. You need a brand new heart. Is that right? She goes, that's right. She looked like she had congestive heart failure. She looked like she was going to die before I could pray for her. I thought, Lord, you better heal her and you better heal her quick. Prayed for her. She fell out of the power. Hopped up. Jumped up. Vibrant. Went back to her seat. Vibrant. Ross gives the altar call. Her and her family came down and gave their life to the Lord. Amen. I mean, she gets healed and saved. That was really cool. So that was Sunday night. Monday, she goes back to the doctor. Cardiologist. She goes walking in there. Be bopping in there. She goes, uh, he goes, what happened to you? She goes, I went to this crazy church service. <laughs> and she said, I, I got a new heart. He goes, I'm healed. That's what she said. He goes, well, I'll be the judge of that. Does an EKG, does another EKG, does another EKG. She said, I'm not paying for this. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what he did. After several EKGs, the doctor goes, you have the heart of a 17-year-old. Okay? So she's healed. The doctor calls the news media. Remember how Ross dared the news media? Or dared them to come? The doctor calls the news media. We came back Friday night. That was, uh, uh, that was Sunday when that happened, then Monday when it happened. We come back. We were there every night through Friday. Come back Friday. You know how you have your foyer here? You couldn't get in the foyer. There were people everywhere. Uh, people with crystals, people with incense, people with candles. This lady brought me a purple amethyst. I still have it to this day. Why? The paper came out that afternoon. Angels bring woman new heart. Christ redeemed her from the curse of the law. That night, Ross preached again. One of the best messages I've ever heard. And all these people ran forward and gave their life to the Lord. So how, how did we get that? Great preaching? No. The lady told me, don't try to do this for a living. So it wasn't great preaching. It's Ross daring them to come. So you set the tone with your authority. So let's do this. We're, it's 8-12. I didn't go too long tonight. Why don't you come back tomorrow night? Uh, let's, let's set the tone for 2020. 
This is January 2020. What do you desire for this year? I mean, I, I would, obviously when I go to praying, I pray over my, my wife, my daughter, my son-in-law, my grandson. Then I pray over my family. I pray over my country. I pray over uh, our leaders. And then I pray over my church. And then I, then I start hitting home again and again, see what direction the Lord wants to go. So let's think about what you desire this year. Think radical. Think what's be something you go like, well, that's just, that's just really pushing the envelope. The Lord gave me a word for last year. It said it was a year of expansion. This year, he just said radical expansion. I'm not one of those guys that gets a word for the year. You know what I'm saying? The church I went to last year, the first church I went to, the pastor goes, the Lord's been talking to me about expansion. I'm like, seriously? So let's expand your heart right now before we pray. What would bless your home? What would bless your kids? What would make your home just so peaceful and so blessed that you could walk in and go... Sense the presence of God on my home. So set the tone. Let's do it here just for a minute before we go. It's 813. We'll pray for just a minute and then we'll go home. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you authorized us. We're amazed that we're laden with Jesus' authority. It's not the authority of the believer. It's Jesus' authority in the believer. So, Lord, we, we approach you not on our merits, but we approach you with Jesus' authority. And we make proclamation over our nation. We thank you for peace in our land. Uh, Satan, you'll not harass our country at all. We thank you for our leaders, our president, vice president, our, our members of his cabinet, the senators, congressmen. We pray for the, the governor of Arkansas. Lord, we pray for the local uh, police officers, the state police in Arkansas. We thank you for, for what you have for Arkansas, Lord. We thank you for it. And Father, what you've given beyond church. We thank you that the households represented here tonight, we thank you for great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We thank you for an explosion of the glory of God in the days to come. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness, Lord. Lord, we set the tone for our lives, our jobs, our families, and we say we're blessed. We have, we, we're over, overcome with blessings. Surely goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our life. We thank you for it. And Father, we see this hour just before the king comes. Help us accelerate. Help us accelerate. We, we push to do your will in a short period of time. We thank you for it. We're amazed at your mercy and kindness. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Now, you, I know you prayed what you wanted for this year. I had a couple words of knowledge, and we'll call them out real quick, then we'll be dismissed. Uh, one, one thing is you have a restriction kind of in your throat. It's almost like you feel like you're choking, but you're not. It's almost like a, a, a false choking, and the devil's tried to scare you with it. You're healed right now. You'll never have to mess with it again. The other thing is the nosebleed. You got damage with your nose. You got no. You got nosebleed. You don't won't have any more nosebleeds. This other one is you got a, a limited amount of uh, air in your lungs. Now, I could miss it, could miss it by a mile. Totally could be so off. Just if I miss it, forget it. It's almost like it's the top part of your lungs. This upper portion right here, you have some kind of damage. And uh, he just loves you. Wants to take care of you. Wants you to use your authority. Amen. Now, those are freebies. Those are just good. They come to you whether you're comfortable with it or not. <laughs> I remember that guy I was telling you stories last night. At, I was preaching in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, Matt Nillette's church. Had a word of knowledge at the end that there's someone here, their thyroid's damaged. They want to put a needle in your thyroid. And I said, your back's healed. Called it out real quick. This guy comes up to me after. He goes, hey, 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 hey. Hey, they want to put a needle in my thyroid. I'm healed. I can feel it. I said, well, man, thanks for coming tonight. He goes, my back too. I said, well, thanks for coming. You're redeemed. We came back to service the next night. His girlfriend walked up to me. You know what, you know what he, she said? She said, you don't understand about my boyfriend last night. The whole time I was preaching, he said about me, he's a con man. He's a con man. He don't like me, don't like my preaching, gets his thyroid healed, gets his back healed. How cool is God? Come on. I'll give you one more. I've told you before, I was preaching in Craig, Colorado. The 22 below zero. You had to have engine block heaters to start your car. It's uninhabitable, I think. But anyway, there, there's a church there. And uh, I was preaching along, and I felt like somebody wanted to kill me. I was just preaching along, because a lot of times I'll say something to ruffle feathers or whatever. I go, man, it just feels like somebody wants to kill me. I had a word of knowledge at the end that someone had been shot in the eye. Remember how I told you I had weird words of knowledge? You know, I saw a woman fly fish one time, catch the hook in her eye. Bartlesville, Oklahoma, saw a woman get poked in the eye with a fork. So when I, when I heard that word of knowledge, I didn't think anything about it. Even Pastor Tommy got me one time. He had hurt his wrist, and uh, I was preaching in his church, and I was walked up on the stage, and the Holy Ghost said, tell him that, that he doesn't have any broken bones. Everything's going to be fine. I came back the next night. Tommy goes, I went to the doctor today, and he told me I shattered all my bones. You missed it by a mile. He goes, I'm just messing with you. No. <laughs> Is that great? 
So, but anyway, I'm, I'm up there in Craig, Colorado, and I, I felt like the whole time I'm preaching uh, that somebody wanted to kill me. And so I called out. Someone got shot in the eye, and, I, and no one came down. I started ministering to some other people. You know how I usually wait on them? I was actually in a hurry because I just needed to preach on end times. I got to keep moving. So I prayed for some other people and forgot about the guy with the eye. Went back to the hotel that afternoon. Colleen and I went down to the lobby of the hotel to get some coffee. This guy comes walking in. He goes, hey, I was coming to the service tonight to kill you. I said, can I get you some coffee? I, mean, I was like, well, do you need cream and sugar? What do you need, buddy? Come on. He goes, no, I'm the guy that got shot in the eye. He goes, I was going to come service and kill you. He said, but this presence came down over me. I got my eyesight back. Called on the name of the Lord. How, how crazy is that? Look at the mercy of God. So right now, before we go, let's magnify his mercy for a moment. Lord, we magnify you. We magnify your mercy. You're amazing. Your mercy is amazing. Your kindness is amazing. We give you glory, we give you honor, and give you praise. We bless you tonight, Jesus. We magnify you tonight, Jesus. We honor you tonight, Jesus. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. We lift you up. We lift you up in this room, Jesus. We thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your kindness, Lord. Praise God. Someone's skin's being healed, too. Don't even know what that is, but your skin's being healed. I sure appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Man, there's great things ahead for the church. There is no bad news for the church. Woo, hallelujah. I sure appreciate you taking the time to come on Monday night. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Remember this as you go. Use your authority, and the Lord loves you. Not mad at you, not frustrated with you. He loves you. Loves you, loves you, loves you. Hallelujah. Well, we'll come back tomorrow night. We'll get into the seven sins of Sapphira. It'll be powerful. No, I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. (laughs) We're not doing that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's Tom's fault. I told you, pure evil was here tonight. We've got to cast it out of him tonight. Hey, thank you for taking the time to come. We'll come back tomorrow night. Can't wait to see what the Lord wants to do. We'll all be blessed. Sure appreciate you coming. Bless you. Pastor Nate, thank you, sir. Give Pastor Nate a big hand as he comes. Sure good to be with you, doctor. So good. So good. I love, um, we're going to dismiss right now. Um, something we always say here. Um, and I, I really believe that this is just another word, confirming word uh, to us as a church. Um, but because the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, you're not going to be satisfied by anything except that which satisfies the love of God. And so when he says you're the stand-in, you're the stand-in. And you can trust, you can trust the love of God in you. You can trust the love of God in you. And... Um, and just I'm excited to hear tomorrow just about just walking naturally supernaturally you can be normal and uh, even the desires of your heart there's a lot of you in here you've seen pictures in your heart you just didn't know how to walk in those things and I love that um, we were just out to lunch today this is like probably the one of the number one things that the church is ignorant and and he actually tells us in 1 Corinthians I would not have you be ignorant (laughs) about spiritual gifts and um, anyway, I'm just, I just, I just know, I just know even just tonight, just, um, I mean, if you just go back the last seven services, I mean, I, I can't even explain how excited I am in my heart, just about what God's doing. Um, and, and really he's fulfilling the desires of your heart because that's the love of God in your heart that you just, if you see, you desire to be used by him and, and see these wonderful things and, um, and you can do it. And I love that, that authorization. You're the stand-in. Hey, hey, will you go tell me about my, my authority? So anyway, just bless you, Father, bless you guys as you go tonight. And we just pray uh, peace over your homes, over your dreams tonight, over your children. And thank you that we are a, a, a church that we know our God. We know our God, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, God bless you guys. Have a great evening. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.